Well, it's a delight to be here. Um, I, I once tried to get a book published with the working title, One of the Trinity Died on the Cross, which I think is a great title. No publisher agreed with me. Um, and the main idea was like, that doesn't sound like a book title. That sounds like a thesis or an argument or like those eight words seem to be coming right in in the middle of a conversation. My pitch was, yeah, exactly. People will want to read this book because it makes this claim, one of the Trinity died on the cross. Um, well, in my heart, I did publish that book, but in reality, I didn't. Um, but I do talk about this. And, and when you talk about one of the Trinity, the Son of God, um, dying on the cross, you're bringing together two massive mega doctrines, you know, the doctrine of the incarnation and the doctrine of the Trinity as a background doctrine that informs it. And I always think of Christian truth in systematic theology um, as a, a field where when you try to talk about or focus on any one particular claim, you find that truth kind of comes rushing towards it from all around it. I think C.S. Lewis mentions this somewhere, that um, the more you try to focus on just one particular bit of our faith, uh, the more the, the ideas kind of come bombarding at you. And this can be disorienting. I sometimes picture like a trampoline that you've evenly spaced a bunch of golf balls on, and then you press down on one of them, right? Then all the golf balls are gonna come click, clack, clack, clacking together in one big mess. Um, I think that that has a positive side to it, right? That all the truth that we believe informs all the rest of the truth that we believe. But I'm well aware that it can sometimes sound like the noise of a lot of golf balls hitting each other on a trampoline. Um, and so a lot of my task is to try to figure out how to take apart doctrines so that we can see them individually and see how they work. But then of course it's crucially important to put them back together again um, so that then you can feel how they work. So you can actually, when you understand and describe um, Jesus' death on the cross for us, that you can say, yeah, I see how this ma it matters that this is one of the Trinity who is undertaking this work for us. Well, so that's what we're gonna do here is sort of take these doctrines apart into some constituent parts uh, and then put them back together. So here's my outline. It's a box and a triangle. Uh, so that's pretty simple. Uh, the box is going to stand in for a particular approach to Christology. Um, you could label it the Chalcedonian box because I'm basically going to work through some of the logic of the Chalcedonian definition, or more broadly, the early Christian tradition of understanding the Bible's teaching about Christ. So. Uh, this will take uh, quite a bit of our time. What we're going to do is sort of build this box in four steps, top, bottom, left side, right side. Um, triangle's going to go away for a while. The triangle represents the doctrine of the Trinity, um, but I just wanted to introduce you to Mr. Triangle right now. He'll come back later on and sort of um, set the larger context for us. So, um, first thing we're going to do is kind of build this box, and I want to talk about the top bar of the box, first of all. Um, th this Christological box, or Chalcedonian box, is a way of framing our thoughts and understanding four key things that we have to affirm about who Jesus Christ is. So the top line is that Jesus Christ is fully God. Um, now, this is a very important doctrine to affirm when we're talking about Jesus Christ, and I could say a lot of things here about the deity of Christ and how to prove it, how to demonstrate it cogently from Scripture. My number one book recommendation as an overview of the case for the deity of Christ is a book called Putting Jesus in His Place uh, by um, Ed Komashevsky and um, uh, uh, Bowman, right? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a great book, and it, it has this nice little um, um, mnemonic device that marshals the case for the deity of Christ by talking about the, it uses the acronym HANDS, H-A-N-D-S, um, that Jesus gets divine honor, divine attributes, divine names, he does divine deeds, and kind of my favorite since we've been talking about Hebrews, he takes the divine seat, he is enthroned. Um, so hands, it's a great overall case. I'm not mostly gonna talk about that. Um, the main point that I wanna make about Jesus as being fully God in the context of building this Christological box is to say that there's a logic of salvation involved here. That is, if Jesus accomplished our salvation 
then he must be fully divine in order to have accomplished that salvation. To get the, the soteriological emphasis here, or the logic of salvation. It's based on the fact that the kind of salvation we're talking about in the Christian gospel is the kind of salvation that brings us into fellowship with God, or you could put it in terms of forgiveness, uh, that we have a personal issue with a holy God and that God must forgive us. Now, if that's what we mean by salvation, then the kind of salvation that the gospel tells us about is one that can't be delegated, right? Um, God can, of course, do anything he wants to. But if he's going to bring about this kind of personal reconciliation salvation, one who is God has to be the one who brings it about. You see that? It's a, it's a proof of the deity of Christ from the nature of the gospel. You could imagine other human problems that needed other solutions beside the gospel, right? Like, let's imagine that our problem is not a sin problem against a holy God, but imagine our problem is just that demons are messing with us and we need a superior power to overcome those demons. If that were the problem, God could have brought about salvation by delegating it, right? He could have assigned Michael to come beat up some demons for us and we would have said, problem solved, yeah? Um, if the problem though is a personal problem of our sin against a holy God, then only God can save us. And it has to be in a personal, direct way. Not by sending somebody who isn't God, but as the New Testament makes clear, by sending somebody who is God. Now notice when I say God saved us directly and personally by sending somebody who is God, I'm trying to not speak explicitly Trinitarianly yet. I'm trying to like draw our attention to the fact that God has to do this personally, and it has to be through a mission, but that mission can't be of another entity. Um, and you can kind of hear like, you're, you might be wondering, why won't he just say father and son? Okay, I will. The father sent the son, yeah. But what I wanna get is the sense that it's gotta be God directly. And this is our, uh, our insight into the deity of Christ from the point of view of salvation. So um, the gospel in this regard is undelegated because it has to do with forgiveness. Um, the name Jesus, of course, means Jehovah saves or Yahweh saves. And so uh, when we're looking at who Jesus Christ is, soteriologically, from the point of view of the gospel, we want to be able to say who Jesus is, is God himself saving us in person. Yeah? So here's the nice, here's the good news. Um, I'm gonna do four points as I construct this box for us really briefly before we move on to the Trinity part of it. And we just did the most important part. So I'm not saying you should zone out or anything, but if you were to do so, we just did the most important thing right there. Um, the deity of Christ is uh, the crucial element of confessing who Christ is biblically. And this is why it was the subject of the first ecumenical council. So Council of Nicaea in the year 325 had to work exactly this logic out to affirm that Christ was God, not through any of the other possible ways you can make that case biblically, those are already right there in scripture, um, but to, to make the argument about the logic of salvation requiring a divine savior. Yeah. Okay, the bottom part of the box uh, is that Jesus Christ is fully human. Now, again, um, there's a clear biblical case for the full humanity of Christ and the way in which he interacts with people and the way he inhabits a real full human existence. But if you're trying to take this salvation thread, this soteriological thread uh, of insight, then what you want to affirm is that the nature of Christian salvation is that God saves us by taking our human nature into union with himself. That is, he, he doesn't um, heal it from a distance or just announce something about it. But if you think about what the incarnation is, it's sort of getting inside the human story, taking up or taking on human nature. The old fashioned word is assuming it. Not in the sense of making an assumption about something, but of like uh, taking up or assuming into union with himself um, the thing that needs to be healed. The axiom that you get from this is um, the, the claim that if Jesus didn't have something, then he didn't heal something, right? If he didn't have it, he didn't heal it. He saves by healing, and so he has to take on all that it requires to be a complete human being. So 
perfectly human. Um, this is especially worked out at the second ecumenical council, the, council, the first council of Constantinople in 381, and uh, Gregory Nazianzus might be the church father who's clearest about this argument. The idea of healing by assuming something into union uh, with himself is uh, powerful in a couple of ways. One, it, it requires you to think through the full humanity of Christ and, for instance, not stop with just the body. So this will keep you from thinking, I guess uh, the Son of God was just the eternal Son of God, but then he took up merely a body and moved it around like a puppet or, uh, or a remote control kind of device or something. That would not be incarnation. That would be like moving around a physical thing and saying, that's my body down there. Incarnation involves an actual human life and soul uh, so that the Son of God took all of that into union with himself. Because everything that belongs to human nature needed to be saved. Now I want to draw attention to an ambiguity here because we use the word saved or healed or even cured, as I'll illustrate with, in two senses. You might say that um, if you have a toothache, you go to the dentist, and we could, in normal English, we would say either that the dentist heals our toothache or heals us, right? And, and, and we use them both way. Grammatically, it's probably the difference between a direct object and an indirect object of a, of a transitive verb. Um, if, so if you're into grammar, there, now you've got that. Um, <laughs> but just in terms of ambiguity, think about like, would you rather have a doctor or a dentist cure your toothache or cure you? Like, or do doctors heal diseases or do they heal patients? Now, if this were a discussion class, we could kind of throw out different ideas, but let me just give you the answer. Do <laughs> doctors both heal diseases and patients, but the word heal means something radically different in the two cases, right? The doctor heals your disease by destroying it. Right? The doctor heals you by restoring you to health. Imagine if he flipped that, right? What if the doctor like restored your disease but eliminated you? That would be, you know, <laughs> operation successful, patient died. Um, so, so it's really important that we, if we have to stop and reflect on it, that we understand what we mean by healing. And that's what's going on here with salvation. Everything that essentially belongs to what human nature is, the Son of God took into union with himself and healed and brought about forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation. Um, but everything which was parasitically attached to human nature as a disease, sin, as the thing that works against the good created nature of humanity, that was eliminated. So our divine physician healed both the disease and the patient, but in different ways, by destroying one and restoring the other. So that is the, um, the, the logic of the full humanity of Christ. Now, again, um, if you want to check out or like, take your winnings right now, I already said the first point was the most important. Now I've added the second point, and together we've really done most of the work already. If you've got a Jesus Christ who is fully divine and fully human, um, then you've really got what you might already recognize as two natures Christology, right? Even if I didn't use the word natures yet, that's what we're dealing with here. For salvation to be what it is, he's got to be fully divine, fully human, and that means that uh, this one savior has these two natures. Nicaea didn't just make the statement, Jesus is God. Nicaea, uh, Council of Nicaea in 325 made that statement indirectly by saying that the son incarnate is of one substance with the father, right? So it's a statement about the son's relation to the father that he's homoousios is the Greek word, or we could make it a long Latinate English word by saying consubstantial. Right? that there's a human substance uh, and there's a divine substance and Jesus has the divine substance in common with the Father. But then you move over to the human uh, side and a later council will say, he's also, just as he's homoousios with the Father, like whatever God is, the Son also is, he's also consubstantial or homoousios with us, that he's whatever we are, the Son of God is, sin only accepted because that doesn't belong to our proper nature as designed by God. So this, um, the technical term for you is double consubstantiality, double consubstantiality, or what we're more comfortable with is two natures Christology, and you might already recognize when I say it that way, we're already doing Chalcedonian theology, right? This is the two natures Chalcedonian Christology. 
So we've got the what and the what. Jesus is what? Fully divine, fully human. The next two councils and the next two sides of the boxes that we're going to look at, um, the left and the right side, really answer the how question. How are these two natures joined in the one person of Christ? Well, um, this is where you have to remember who has these two natures. And the answer is the one person, Jesus Christ. The third ecumenical council, the Council of Ephesus in the year 431, took this up, and they were especially concerned with one thing. They didn't do a whole robust theology of what they meant by the one person exactly. We'll get to that in a minute, because we do have to sneak the whole doctrine of the Trinity in here to answer this who question, because the word person we're really taking from Trinitarian theology. But here's what's being affirmed here when you're building this box. It's that you don't make the mistake of splitting the incarnate one into two different persons, right? It's one person with two natures, but you don't want to ever make the mistake of saying um, it's two persons in the incarnation, as if there were a human Jesus and a divine Jesus, both hanging out in the one Jesus somehow, right? So um, in in your uh, history of doctrine book, the name for this heresy would be Nestorianism. The basic idea is failing to grasp the unity of the one person who is divine and human. Kind of getting so interested in the God-man distinction, the two natures, that you accidentally split and think of um, two different persons. Now, it's a little hard to actually hold this as a doctrine, but it's pretty easy to accidentally talk this way, if you know what I mean. If you ever find yourself saying a phrase like, well, the human Jesus died on a cross, but the divine Jesus you can, you can tell there's no way I'm going to finish that sentence and make it good, right? Because I've already started into a way of talking that is implicitly Nestorian and that fails to recognize the unity of the one person who is Jesus Christ. I've, I've gotten distracted by the two natures, and I've tried to sort of like assign a person to each nature, and that's not going to work. It's got to be two natures in this one person. There is no such word as Jesus. Right? right? Like, if, if you're talking about the incarnation and you start thinking of Jesus, you have made a mistake. You have divided by zero somewhere. So, like, go back, get in tune with your biblical intuitions, and try again on that sentence because it's just, it's not going to work out. Now, I don't mean to just be a language cop and police this and say, like, don't talk about the human Jesus. Don't talk about the divine Jesus. That, that's implicitly Nestorian. Um, I, I really only intend to uh, insist on this language to sort of help you begin thinking properly. It's, you probably had this problem when you begin trying to talk about Trinity or Christology and you say something about, well, the divine part of Jesus, like, uh, part? You know, I teach Socratically for a living. That's, that's what I do. I just ask questions all the time. I never stand in the front of a room and uh, make true statements like I'm doing right now. This is kind of, uh, normally I just ask annoying questions over and over. So when a student will say like, the divine part of Jesus, I'll say, part? What percentage? Like what? Do you mean part? And they'll almost always fold up and say, okay, I didn't mean part. I'm sorry I said that. And again, I'm not just about getting the right answers, but it really does matter, right? Um, I think of a couple cases in, in my, uh, w- with my wife where one of us will talk a certain way and have to be corrected by the other one because it's just not the right way to describe something. So. When I was in grad school, I would write papers and turn them in. Then I began working on my dissertation. I took this very seriously. I was very frightened of not finishing the dissertation. It's a book. Um, And my wife would ask me, how are you doing on your paper? And I would say, okay, I don't think I'm I'm fragile about this, but I need you to quit calling it a paper. (laughs) It's like, it's extremely long and I fear that I might not complete it. And, and she would apologize and say, I'm sorry, that sounded like I meant your little paper, but I know you're, I know I take this very seriously. More recently, we've had the same problem. She's in charge of children's ministry at our church, and she, has, she does um, three to five minute lessons for the elementary school kids. Um, and, and, and it's three to five, but I've taught some of these, and you want to go three, right? Because like minute four gets really dicey. Um, <laughs> I would much rather talk to this sort of an audience about this sort of a thing than prep one of those three-minute lessons. Um, And so as she's like working on one for Sunday, I'll ask something like, how's your little talk going? (laughs) 
So now we've flipped it, right? Like she would ask me for years how my paper is going, and now I ask her about her little talk. In my mind, I mean it's three minutes. But of course, in her prep time, it's like, oh no, I have to get the entire doctrine in my mind and think about how to communicate this at an appropriate age level. There's nothing little about it. So when I try to correct your language, I'm just kind of saying like, if you learn to avoid phrases like the human Jesus did this and the divine Jesus did that, you're gonna set yourself up for much better success in making coherent ideas well expressed. Um, so this was at the Council of um, Ephesus 431, and we are ready to move on to um, the two natures affirmed at the Fourth Ecumenical Council, the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451. Now, you might notice we already did the two natures back when we had the first two councils. We had that logic in place. The, I, the reason this had to be reaffirmed at Chalcedon was to emphasize that even in and during and after the incarnation, it's still two natures. You know what I mean? It's not just that once upon a time there was the divine nature and then the Son of God assumed the human nature into union with himself and then they turned into one nature, that would be the error for them to turn into one nature after the incarnation. Chalcedon affirms the two natures continue to be distinct natures in their union in the one person. Uh, they don't morph into each other. That is to say, they are, the divine and human are not mingled in Jesus. The Son of God incarnate has both natures in their integrity. Uh, he unites them in his person or hypostasis, that's why we call this the hypostatic union, but they don't merge into each other. Uh, if you think of uh, yellow representing the divine nature and blue representing the human nature, at no point do you get green, right? It, it continues to be yellow and blue. Um, green would, if you think about it, undercut the logic of mediation. What we need is a mediator between divine and human. If you end up with someone who is neither yellow nor blue, but green instead, then you have a third reality in between them, and mediation, uh, the logic of mediation isn't happening. You actually need someone who um, reaches both rather than being a third thing in between. Um, I think one of the things that leads us to possibly uh, start down towards this mistake is to think of the divine nature and the human nature coming together at a certain point um, as if they were sort of equal and opposite or something, and then the question is how to combine them. What you've got to remember here, if it's sort of slipped from your view, is the divine nature is bigger and older than the human nature. You know what I mean? I, and I'm not even talking about Jesus at this point. I just mean think about the divine nature. How big and how old is that? Well, it's infinite and eternal. Okay. Tell me about human nature. Is that infinite and eternal? Well, no, it's created and, and finite. It's got a certain, you know, it's a, it's a work of God to create such a thing as created nature and human nature is a subset of it. So then when you turn to the incarnation, you can't just treat these two as parallels and say Jesus has one of these and one of those. What you have to recognize is, oh, lest I forget, he's got these two natures, but one of them is infinite and eternal. And um, this is actually one of the reasons why you want to make sure not to mingle them. Because if the divine nature is yellow and the human nature is blue and you merge them into one, you don't actually get green, right? What, what happens if you take a tiny bit of blue and add it to an infinite amount of yellow? The blue just goes away, right? If I go down to the ocean and throw a bottle of ink into it, I mean, I shouldn't do that, it's kind of stupid, but I have not significantly stained the ocean dark in terms of parts per billion, right? Similarly, the divine and human nature um, need to be kept distinct, lest, <laughs> it's sort of like for the good of the human nature, lest the divine nature swallow up the human nature without remainder. So what we have in the hypostatic union, the incarnation, is a union of divinity and humanity, but it's not a natural union. It's not that the two natures morph into one new thing. It's that the two natures are in the one person. Um, that's why we call it a hypostatic union, and I think, um, I think Steve used the phrase um, uh, theanthropos, or theanthropic, uh, sort of God-man. It's a good phrase. You have to remember that it's referring to this person having these two natures, 
as opposed to sort of like taking two kinds of Play-Doh and massaging them together and calling that, you know, like the Anthropos or something. It's, it's not that kind of mingled union. It's a hypostatic union. So um, I want to say what, these box, what this box is doing. So we've got the top, uh, fully God. We've got the bottom, fully man. Then we ask the question, how do they go together? And you might notice I didn't give you a definite, positive, clear answer. I give you a bunch of negatives, right? Don't make this mistake and don't make that mistake. Definitely affirm full deity, definitely affirm full humanity. Don't diverge the two um, so that they are two different Jesai, and don't merge the two so that they're one new essence. Um, put them together without making these mistakes. And just in general, that's what this box is. Lest you think I have come in here and committed the theological sin of putting God in a box, right? <laughs> right? The box I have built here is to contain our understanding, uh, to make sure we rise to the level of full humanity and full divinity, and to make sure that we don't go outside of uh, the zone in which true thoughts can be thought and true statements can be made. So it's not God in a box, but um, limits for our thinking. Because if you transgress any of these boundaries, you end up with, if you transgress the top boundary, you end up with a uh, non-divine savior. Transgress the bottom boundary, you end up with a non-human savior. Uh, transgress to the left and you end up with Jesai, bad thing. Uh, transgress to the right and you end up with a kind of a morphed third uh, nature involved in the incarnation. So we don't want to do that. Uh, these are limits on our thinking. Now what goes in the box is of course not God, but uh, this is my quick sketch of the life of Jesus Christ. So you heard I was a cartoonist and now you're suitably impressed. Uh, yeah. Four years of art school right there. Uh, <laughs> um, it's just a stick figure diagram that I put up regularly to indicate uh, the birth. That's a manger with a halo over it, and that's not a football floating over it. It's a, it's a, uh, so the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. I will say the cloud with feet going into it is actually an ancient Christian way of depicting the ascension. The, the apostles are standing around looking up. They see a cloud, and there are feet going into it. And they, because it says in Acts, right, he, he went up and was received by a cloud. Um, so it might be a little bit silly, but it's just a conceptual placeholder, and it has a venerable Christian tradition of being represented that way. The point here is that we're always focused in doing this kind of Christology and trying to establish boundaries so that we don't go outside of them and make an error and fail to con confess the identity of Christ rightly. We're always engaged in the act of reading scripture and understanding the narrated life of Jesus. We're understanding what he did and who he is to have done what he did. Um, so it's always coming back to reading the gospels, knowing the life of Christ, and in each one of these cases asking um, at Christmas time about the baby in the manger. How is this fully God, fully man, uh, one person in two natures, asking at each one of these events of uh, what they used to call the mysteries of the life of Christ, the events within the economy of salvation that he carries out among us and for our salvation, um, how is the full reality of who he is represented here in scripture? So it's the gospel story and the Christological incarnational toolkit for reading it well and understanding it. But it still leaves us with the question, as we carry out this exercise, of who he is. Like, who is the one who does these things? We can make all the right statements about what he is, fully God, fully man. We can make statements about how he is fully God and fully man. But I don't know if you noticed that the, the who question sort of escapes the box in certain ways. Yeah? When we say one person with the Council of Ephesus, we just mean not two persons. Um, but did we succeed in answering the question, who is the one person that this person is? And this is where it's really important to recognize that the economy of salvation, as I've drawn it there, um, is kind of little. I'm just moving it to the corner there to show you it's, um, it's a great thing, but God is greater. I'm not playing these off against each other. What I'm trying to do is establish a sense of perspective. I'm an evangelical. I'm rightly centered up on the biblical witness to the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ um, um, for our salvation. But at some point, you have to take a step back and say, 
the whole human project, including its fall and its rescue from its fall, all of that is a vast thing, but a created and finite thing. And if you want to put it up against the context of an infinite, eternal God, then you have to say it's comparatively small. Um, so now I'm going to reintroduce our friend the triangle, who represents the Trinity. And uh, there it is. I, I drew it bigger just because I needed to show you that it is larger to make the point that in turning from the incarnation, which is for our salvation, to the doctrine of God proper, we're turning to something much, much vaster, right? Um, and even by putting a giant triangle up there, uh, I need to indicate to you that it's not to scale, <laughs> right? You know that little legend on a map where you think like, oh, that looks pretty close, and then it says, oh, not to scale. Oh, so this could be many more miles than is sort of like visually represented by the proportions. Yeah, all you can get from this triangle is that it's bigger. Yeah. But if I drew the triangle, the actual size of what it represents, that is the triune God, then you wouldn't be able to see the economy of salvation, right? It would be vanishingly tiny by comparison. But if I draw the economy of salvation, the incarnation, big enough for you to see, then I would have to draw the triangle so big that the room could not contain it. My way of representing that is to just have it going off the screen a little bit, yeah? So you're supposed to see that and go, oh yes, bigger. Yeah, yeah. But not to scale really matters. Whenever we bring concepts into our mind, when we read the Bible and think thoughts and combine the ideas in our head and try to do a responsible job combining these ideas, you gotta remember the ideas are sort of movable, aroundable, and manageable, but they represent infinite realities. And when we're dealing with the doctrine of God, the eternal, blessed existence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever, we're dealing with something truly infinite, like truly eternal. It blows out all the possible boundaries of thought. You need to come back in from that perspective to say, God truly is with us in this way, in the incarnation. Um, but when I've said that sentence, I've said something gigantic, and I'm having to think thoughts that are not quite to scale. So, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. When we ask the who question, notice that we couldn't really frame it within the context of the box. I'm proud of the box. I like it. I use it all the time to teach. But the definition of the actual person who is involved in carrying out that incarnate ministry won't fit. It, it comes in the, the identity, the personal identity of who the Savior is, is a Trinitarian reality. What I mean is, the depth of the personhood, of the person of Christ, comes from the, the reality of God the Trinity. Um, let me just say in terms of this conference, which is on the person of Christ, I've spent some time establishing the two natures of Christ and how they relate, because that's a nice well-rounded Christology that's gonna help us think Trinitarianly as well. But we're actually trying to focus on, on the who, right? Who, who is the person of Christ? And the, the answer to the question, who is the person of Christ, can't be solved just by incarnational theology. It's got to appeal out beyond it to Trinitarian theology. If you try to solve the who question just by, answer, just by using incarnational stuff, you're going to end up thinking something like the incommunicable personal identity of who this person is uh, depends on him being born of Mary. You're going to like tie his very identity, definition of his reality, to the events of salvation history. But when you've done that, you've blown your ability to confess him as fully God. Because God's identity isn't constituted by the things that God does in history. And this really comes to a point when you're trying to understand who is the Son. Let me just say that our Savior brings his sonship into salvation history with him from somewhere higher. He, he comes to us as the eternal son. I do think that this is why so many of our best Christmas carols end up having questions that are just sort of like questions of adoration and observation, like, who is this child? Who is he? You know, come let us adore him. There's this sort of um, quiet acknowledgement that when we're up against the incarnation of this one in this manger, we're dealing with a personal reality of infinite depth. 
Like it, it, it's really the son, and to put it negatively, would have been the eternal son of God even if the incarnation had not happened, right? I'm not, I'm not mostly in the business of thinking away the incarnation hypothetically, um, but if we're in the business of thinking things away to sort of get clarity, you could say even if there were no creation, even if there were nothing but God, the son would be the son. This is why we confess that the son is eternally the son is eternally generated or eternally begotten. So this is the great Trinitarian doctrine of eternal generation. Notice I call it a Trinitarian doctrine and not merely an incarnational doctrine because he brings his sonship with him into salvation history. If we hadn't just heard from Bobby Jameson yesterday, I'd have to take pains to say, there's also an economic sonship that really matters a lot. It's gonna help you read Hebrews and the rest of the Bible, right? But since we've heard that exposited really well, I'm only emphasizing the first half of what Bobby says about Hebrews is that there's an eternal sonship and only the one who is eternal son is qualified and able to bring about and enact and fulfill the economic sonship. So we could say son of God and son of Mary, son of God and son of man. Um, eternal generation is non-biblical language uh, to capture a biblical truth. And the biblical truth is that the son didn't start being the son when he took on flesh, but is always the son of the father, or to flip that around, you could say that God has always been father and son in the unity of the Holy Spirit. To call it generation or begetting, I'll come back to that word in a minute, um, makes it sound like I'm telling a story. When I say the son is eternally begotten, it kind of sounds like, well, I get how this plot works. Once upon a time, the son was not begotten, then he was begotten, so there he is. It, it sounds like there must be a time before that. But that's why every time we say generation, we put eternal in front of it. Because um, it's just reflecting on the language father and son and asking what is the relation between the father and the son? Well, I think the father fathers the son. You know, you notice I didn't, I didn't actually bring any new information in there. I didn't smuggle in secret new information. I just conceptually unfolded the divinely given names father and son. Um, the problem is we don't really use the word father that way anymore. Um, if I say that I father my children, you mostly think about my parenting technique, right? Um, to, to father or to parent it kind of involves raising a child. We used to have a word for what a father does to a son. Uh, that word was beget, yeah? Um, beget is the masculine equivalent of uh, birth. So a son, a child is born of a mother, but a child is begotten of a father. I, a lot of people say like, wow, I've never thought about that before. It's because the word beget has gone from being a generally used word to only being a word we find in Trinitarian theology or the genealogies if you're reading the King James Version, right? Um, we, we have a word for, what, uh, for how a child comes from a father um, when we're talking about racehorses. We could say that a horse sires a child, but you can't talk like that about humans or God because people will blow a whistle on you. It's, it's just, so if I were doing widespread cultural criticism here, I could say, what do you think of a culture that doesn't have a word for the relation of a father to a child? <laughs> and say, does that seem like a healthy receptor culture to you that we could talk about biblical realities in? Um, I'm narrowing my vision here and I'm just trying to speak clearly about uh, biblical theology and Trinitarian theology. The relation of the, let me use really unbiblical language, the relation of the first person of the Trinity to the second person of the Trinity is eternally, by nature, a relation of father to son. Um, if you say it with verbs, you would say the father fathers the son, the father generates the son, eternally, always has. So for the purposes of our discussion of the person of Christ, the big picture to get here is that the sonship of the incarnate son is eternal and comes into salvation history with him. So he brings um, sonship with him into salvation history. There are a lot of reasons this is great, um, but let me just cut to the fact that it means something of the divine life, something of the dynamic of the blessedness of what it is to be God is present among us in union with our nature. 
So he brings sonship with him into salvation history, which makes it available to us. And this is why the whole biblical theology of becoming children of God, in Paul's language, adoption, um, is not just a metaphor, right? It's not just that God worked out a salvation and thought, let's see, I'm a good communicator. What should I compare that to? It's kind of like adoption. Or to use John's language, um, he gave us power to become uh, children of God. It's not merely that kind of metaphor as if God were illustrating what salvation is. It's actually the case that there is an eternal reality in God of father-son relation, and that by incarnation and atonement, we created fallen creatures are included in this eternal reality in God. We participate in the sonship relation of the eternal son who became the incarnate son who made it possible for us to be adopted sons, right? That's the, the long lines of the doctrine of sonship start up in the Trinity in a statement about who God is and pay off not only in the accomplishment of our salvation, but in the everyday living out of the reality of our salvation. So the Christian life, the inner secret of Christian life is for it to take on the character of sonship, of filiality, um, to Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, uh, that we should be called children of God, and we are. So there's a reality made over to us in that regard. Um, adoption by union with Christ is the doctrine of salvation that flows from this um, Trinitarian incarnational teaching. By the way, just an aside here on um, the, the kind of ministry that I prefer to do theologically when I can. I'm, I'm a very uh, experiential kind of evangelical theologian, um, kind of like, this is my story, this is my song, I want to wear, bear witness to the reality of salvation. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, Pentecostal and got saved in a Methodist church in a youth group revival, and, and so the sort of warm, I, I'm not an effusive personality or anything, but the kind of warm-hearted evangelicalism is, is uh, ground zero for me. What I find is that we can be pretty good at that as Christians, but our traditions often need just a big dose of objective truths of the faith. So more incarnation, more doctrine of the Trinity, and then we can see them pay off better in our piety and our daily experience. So um, I started by talking about how one of the Trinity died on the cross, and I wanna just connect a few of those dots now for you because I think we've taken apart um, the uh, Christology and the uh, Trinitarian theology. And I want to kind of put it back together. If you think about our, our heroes, the uh, box and the triangle, and how they go together, um, uh, what we're talking about here is our salvation being the work of the entire Trinity uh, through the incarnation of one person of the Trinity. Right? So, um, when we say uh, that the Son of God took human nature to himself, we don't mean that the Son of God sort of left heaven and as an independent agent carried out a project that he then sent progress reports on, right? The incarnation is the work of the entire Trinity. Uh, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit cause the incarnation, the enfleshment, the taking on of human nature by the Son. But the work that they do is to appropriate that human nature to the second person. So it's the, only the Son is incarnate, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work the incarnation. This is just one of the applications of the general principle that everything God does, uh, he does as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're the inseparable outer works of the Trinity. In a really kind of homey illustration of this, um, Martin Luther said that um, in the incarnation, uh, God puts on human nature, but here we have this uh, direct indirect object thing again, but the Father and the Spirit put the human nature onto the Son. Yeah, and he compared it to um, two young women helping a third young woman put on a dress, right? All of them put on the dress, it's just that two of them put it on the third one. So the inseparable operation of the work of God in the incarnation, such that the human nature of Jesus Christ is the human nature of only the second person, yeah? 
What this means is when we say something like one of the Trinity died on the cross, we've got all these distinctions and considerations in place, and then we can say one of the Trinity died on the cross, or let me put it even more starkly. Um, Charles Wesley has a hymn where he says, "'Tis mystery all the immortal died." You know that one? Our amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? These are bold statements. Um, and as a theologian, it's tempting to kind of want to backpedal, right? But if you think about all the distinctions we've got in place, three persons, two natures, um, the triangle in the box, yeah, you can say, oh, here's what's going on. When I say God died on Good Friday, I don't have to take that back. I just have to make sure you have all the Christian distinctions in mind when I say it, right? Um, what you need to know is that the second person of the Trinity truly took human nature into union with himself, and in that human nature experienced death. You might be tempted to think, if you say God died, then there's got to be an equation like, here's, here's God and here's man. And just as man has a death, there's such a thing as human death, here's human existence, here's human death. There must be on the other side of the equation such a thing as God and divine death. Do you, do you, do you see that? I'm going to I'm going to deny that equation in a minute, but do you hear how talking about God dies suggests that sort of equation? And then you think, so it must be that like just as people die, as humans die, God died, and you want to put God into the category of divine death, but guess what? That's an empty set. There, there's no such thing by definition as divine death. So when we say with Charles Wesley and the great Christian tradition, God died, what we mean is God took to himself human nature and died the only death on the market. It's not that God was afraid of this scarier death down here. There's no such thing as this scarier death down here. There's no divine death for God to fall into. So for us and our salvation, God took human nature to himself and, in, and truly experienced human death. The only one on the market. It's crucial that you know God's not avoiding a worse death. He's going after the one death that is our problem. So, um, with all these distinctions in place, this really works. You might have to rehearse it a little bit, because when someone like Charles Wesley or any preacher, Martin Luther, Augustine, say things like God died or um, one of the Trinity died on the cross, they are trying to jolt you into recognition of what an amazing thing this is. If you haven't heard or rehearsed any of these distinctions before, if you haven't kind of like thought through the box, then... I freely admit, and we should be aware that this is how our friends will hear this if they haven't thought theologically. It sounds like you say God died, then you explain the Trinity and the Incarnation, and it sounds like you're saying, what I mean is one half of one third of the Trinity had a bad weekend, <laughs> right? You see how it sounds like just an ad hoc, I made this up so I can say wild things in my sermon but then take it all back? Um, but in fact, the Trinitarian incarnational theology that we've been rehearsing is not a set of ad hoc distinctions. It's the very thing that we're talking about that leads us to say things like, one of the Trinity died on the cross, or God experienced death for our salvation. So, um, in conclusion, I have a very simple summary of what I'm saying here. It's that the, trini the triangle is bigger than the box. Yeah. I mean, you, you need them both in a, in a, in a uh, conference on the person of Christ. We're mainly focused on the realities that are confessed within that conceptual box. But when we're talking about the person, person is a word from triangle land, right? It's, I hope this is not too condensed of a way of putting it. Person is a Trinitarian reality. The second person, the incarnate one, is from that reality, brings it into our reality. The triangle is bigger than the box, and yet somehow the triangle is inside of the box. How is that? Well, as the Bible confesses, the fullness of Godhead dwelt bodily in Christ. And as a result of that, we are filled with the fullness of God. It would probably take another lecture to begin to work out how that's possible for a larger reality to be active inside of a smaller reality in that way. But these are the things we confess. Thank you.